Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Glenn. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Glenn. So, you know, I can live up to being enthusiastic, but about being a good guy, you know, that's because <laughs> I promise you that um, when I slithered into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous in late August of 1986, um, I was anything but a good guy, and you would not have described me that way. So, thanks. I'm humbled. I'm humbled that you would describe me that way. Are you from New York? I am not from New York, <clears throat> but I could be. My family is from New York. If you pick that up, that's what's going on. I am. Um, I find it very unusual that, wait, I can see the reflection. Okay, so right now, it's five minutes to three. (laughs) Until two o'clock, right? So if I do this, I promise I'm not texting during the meeting. It's probably just one of those things like the guy that looks at his watch, you know, then he looked at it again. So pardon me if I have my phone out here. Anyway, it's an honor and a privilege to be um, in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and to get a chance to talk. Don't ever ask me to talk, because I will, Aaron, and I don't care. I will talk all night long <laughs> until 2 o'clock. So uh, anyway, I want to apologize uh, for whatever I say that's going to be bad, because you could have probably done it better, but you're going to have to wait till the 16th to find out. <laughs> I'm coming back, because I'm going to sit there and give you the evil eye that you're doing to me right now. <laughs> Do a little bit of uh, AA business. Thank you very much, Jerry, for asking me to come out. And... Um, tell you that I honor and love, absolutely love the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous and Tradition 3 gets me in the door and I have a desire to stop drinking. I had that when I got here. Didn't know how much I had it, but I had it and I have it today. I have a desire to stay stopped. But I just want to tell you that during my story, you may or may not know that I used to, may or may, not, may, or may not notice that I'll use the term, you know, other fun things. I did a lot of other fun things. And I'll wrap that up with one sentence. My nickname in high school was Iron Lungs Bigler. And you can do <laughs> All right, there you go. I did a lot of fun stuff, including drinking, including not even knowing to the degree about that, that I had alcoholism, but I, I got a pretty good case of it. And um, here's the proof. It's Friday night, and I'm on vacation, and I'm out visiting some friends, and I'm in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I mean, that pretty much says it all, and if you're new or near new, I want to help you work the first three steps. It's Friday night. You're in a church basement, something like a church basement, in an AA meeting. So I'm pretty sure that you got a problem with alcohol. Your life is horribly unmanageable, and that something brought you into this room to deal with some insanity. So welcome, and then you're going to say a prayer, and you're in. And you're on, you're on your fourth step now. So I'm your new sponsor if you're new or near new. <laughs> you're on step four, and what's taking you so long? Okay. I'll meet you at 1015 in the parking lot, and we're going to hear your fifth step. You're on your way. Anyway, I'm not wrapped too tight. Jerry said to me as he walked by, um, is it fair to say that you're very disturbed? We agreed. We're just not sure if we're going to put the emphasis on very or disturbed. So, see, a little AA business. I told you that it's um, a privilege and an honor to be here. And um, I, I say that with all sincerity. I, I've reached a point of epic lameness in my recovery is that I actually love AA. I love being sober. And the, some coffee spilled, right? And, and I ran to the back and got the things, and I'm wiping it up. We made a joke about it, but the truth is, like, I'll take that. I'll take that job in AA, not a problem. I'll, I'll wash the ashtrays and I'll, I'll clean the coffee cups and I'll sweep up. I, I don't care what job you give me, just let me stay. And that's what you guys did for me when a very broken young man showed up in uh, late August. Is uh, Luckily, there were some people around AA long enough when I got there that you knew how to love me and point me towards the steps and, and, and tolerate me. Man, if it wasn't for love and tolerance, let's put the emphasis on tolerance because I broke every rule and did all the bad behaviors and had the worst foul mouth around, you know, and... and um, Good to see you. I don't know where I know you from. Nice to see you. Oh, yeah. Oh, you. (laughs) Good to see you again. Swear to God. You have a twin sister. Okay, it's fine. (laughs) Did I mention I have ADD? (laughs) AT&T? DVDs? We got all that. Okay, good talk. Um, But... uh, I want to give you the Quentin Tarantino version of my talk because uh, years ago somebody asked me to tell, tell my story and I kind of said, yeah, I'll do it. And I'm telling the story, telling the story, and I'm not paying attention to the clock. And it's like i got five minutes left and I'm still like in boot camp in the Navy. So I'm going to give you the end now. Like, you know, you watch a Quentin Tarantino movie and he's telling, telling you, you don't realize you just saw the end of the movie. But I would feel remiss if I didn't get to give you the here and now of it. What's my life like today? <laughs> Then I can go, we can go back in time and tell you all the ridiculous stories and kind of trouble I got in and kind of trouble I caused. But I want you to know that today I'm sponsored 
and I'm well sponsored. I love my sponsor. I love and respect that man. He takes the time to take me through the steps and you know show me where I'm off the beam and help point me towards the right answer. So I have a sponsor and I sponsor other men. I go to meetings. I go to regular meetings of a home group in Huntington Beach, California called the Triangle Group. If you're ever out there on a Wednesday or a Friday or a Saturday, come on by. And um, you know, I love AA. I love what it's done for me. I, I'm, I'm responsible and accountable to the fellowship. And that, you know, right, is kind of sounds epically lame to me. If I was new and I heard some guy up here saying, man, I love AA and I'm responsible and accountable, I would just be like, what? Because I didn't come here to be this. I didn't come here to be this. So there's, there's what it is today. I have way more blessings and way more friends than I do problems. I have solutions to whatever comes up. I, ha I have a way of life that I, I never could have dreamt. And when you tell people when they're new, write down your dreams, buddy, because, you know, five or ten years from now, you're going to look back at that and go, wow, you sold yourself short. That's the truth for me. That really is true for me. I'm super grateful to be in AA, super grateful to know people like you who love and tolerate me and show me, show me through your living examples of, of what I got to do to get right. Because when I got here, it just wasn't that way. So... That's where I'm at today. I'm, I'm glad to be sober, and um, I have a plan. My plan is it's Friday night. I'm going to stay sober tonight. I bet there's a lot of people in this room that like that plan, and um, I'm thrilled to see that I'm, you know, I could be here. It could be me and Jerry. Maybe, maybe you know, my friends back here. But it's Friday night, a holiday weekend. I can't believe you know that this is where we are, and I, probably no place I'd rather be on a Friday night than in an AA meeting, hanging out with folks I, I like and folks I love, and et cetera, et cetera. So. That's, that's the here and now. And I, I know that um, if I keep taking these steps, taking these simple steps and working myself through them, I surrender myself to the program and I get closer and closer to that power that you guys said I would meet along the way. All right, born at a young age in uh, <laughs> Los Angeles, California, and I have two older sisters. I had great parents. I didn't know that, of course, growing up. I thought my parents were pretty bad. But in hindsight, it turns out after I got sober, I had great parents. I learned that first time my sponsor came to my parents' house, where, by the way, every tough guy at 25 years old when he's broken down moves back into mom and dad's house. <laughs> tough guy. And so I'm there, and my sponsor comes, and he meets my, my folks. We're walking out of the house, and he says, man, you, your dad's really cool. And I, I really thought that I misheard him, because I would have could have sworn you my dad was just a, not really very cool. And no, my dad was cool. My dad was great. I had great parents. And I didn't know that. They had two girls, and then they wanted a boy so bad Surprise, they got me, and boy, did I make them regret it. I'm a 100% boy. I like um, to break things, play with matches, tell lies, steal things. That's, you know, so that's, sounds like a good start to a good time to me. I like to eat ice cream and pull people's hair. And did I mention tell lies? I'm good at telling lies. So that's what's going on with me growing up. I'm uncomfortable in my own skin. I don't, I don't even feel like I belong in that family. My sisters seem well-adjusted. My parents are loving and kind, and none of that. It's all just bouncing right off of me. And I can remember, for instance, being in uh, elementary school, and the bell rings. You're out of the playground because you're on snack time or break time or whatever you're on. You're playing kickball or something, and the bell rings, and everybody stops. And all the kids turn, and they face towards the classrooms from the playground. They all start walking that way. Because I guess they got the rule book. When the bell rings, you go to class. You know why I went that way? Because everybody else did. Which brings me to a point that I like to say sometimes when I remember it is uh, when they say, your parents always ask, you know, all your friends jump off the cliff, you're going to jump off the cliff? You know the answer is no. I'm thinking probably. And that happened one time. We were all doing some of those uh, other funny things that we do in high school. And then you hold your breath a long time. And my buddies were jumping off the rocks down into the puddle of water down there. I didn't, it looked unsafe. But fear will sometimes make you do things that you wouldn't normally do. And I was afraid, but I'm like, well, what's worse, breaking your neck down there or looking like the big chicken and having to live that down? So, you know, boosh, luckily, you know, didn't break the neck that time. Anyway, that's just the kind of guy I am, you know, just chicken enough, but brave enough to, you know, become Iron Lungs Bigler because I got to do something. So, by the way, uh, thank you to my friend Shauna for praying me up. Yeah, I just got to mention this in case this goes horribly wrong. Uh, <laughs> We're off to an okay start, but you never know. We got until two. So the um, thing is that clearly this is not my fault. Shauna prayed me up, and she asked God to rem remove me from ego and pride. I thought, what the heck is left? And then Aaron tried to assault me, and I would like to ask some tough guys if they'll walk me to my car later, because she did tell me people have left in an ambulance for this meeting. And then, uh, So I wasn't even supposed to speak tonight, and I got prayed up. So, yeah, it's not my fault. Wherever we go from here, just want to clear that up.
in case you don't like this so far, it's going to get much better. <laughs> Any minute now. You, uh, for those of you not familiar with the tradition four in the 12 and 12, um, I'm uh, the poster child for Rule 62. If they ever make a poster, I am going to, I will, I will cut you because I want to be the poster child for that. I will not be the poster child for um, perfect attendance and perfect behavior in an AA meeting. That's definitely Jerry, not me. But I'm, uh, okay, I was looking right at you, but I was thinking about Bill. The um, Rule 62 is pretty much what allows me to stay here, right? Just do all this stuff. And I'm, I wear life like a loose garment, except when it comes to the 12 steps, I promise you I'm very serious about that. So let's see, where am I? I'm in elementary school, and I, my skin doesn't fit right, and I'm, I'm maladjusted, and I'll do anything uh, just to fit in. Like, I'll jump off the cliff, and I'll, you know, the bell rings, and I'm going to walk to class just because everybody else is walking to class. And this continues on until junior high when I meet the right crowd. You know, I don't want to, I'm not coordinated enough to be a jock, and I'm not really smart enough to, they sent me to the special school. Special classes. I, yeah, I went to special class, but I couldn't pay attention. You know, they give you a little test and, you know, circle the circle. And, oh, yeah, you go to the gifted class. Awesome. Well, a guy like me, I can't pay attention in any normal class. Why am I going to pay attention in a rocket scientist class? So <laughs> they kick me out of there. And I just don't fit in anywhere until one day I see these guys with leather jackets and they're playing um, Black Sabbath and ACDC and Kiss and all this music. And they seem pretty cool. And they let me hang out with them. And Next thing you know, um, you know, I'm doing the funny stuff that they do. And wow, what a success. I, I remember in high school, the time I hit high school, really enjoyed all these behaviors because it just made me feel a part of, and I just could relax, like for the first time, just, you know, grades don't matter, you know, none of that, none of that matters. I, I decided somewhere in, somewhere in high school, I made the decision that that was the lifestyle I wanted to live every day. Every day I wanted to drink and carry on with all those behaviors, and I just thought this was going to be my lifestyle on the way to school, at break, the way home from school, before dinner, after dinner, and then don't forget you're going to sneak out at like 1 or 2 a.m. to go do that again. And um, I wish I was making that up, but that's, that's exactly how I wanted to live. So go figure that here comes uh, 18 years old, and my folks have pretty much had it with me. They don't like me stealing their things and selling it for, you know, my, my method of get the things that I wanted to get. They, they didn't like that. Go figure. So they gave me for my 18th birthday the gift, which was freedom from living in their house. They said, hey, you're 18 now, and we think you should go live somewhere else and not steal our things anymore. So this is before cell phones. My aunt, God bless her soul, I don't know how she even got a hold of me, but, but she, it was a new record. They, it, um, sorry. They, um, my aunt tracks me down, and she was highly offended that my parents could kick me out, their own flesh and blood. She was offended, and I like to say that she was uh, just a couple of Al-Anon meetings short of a slip, but that may be offensive to an actual Al-Anon member. <laughs> so I want to apologize, but I like that part of the story. Anyway, not really, not really a sincere apology. I still think it's funny. So she gets me on the phone. I want you to come live with me in Los Angeles and be somebody. Excellent. Now we're getting somewhere. So back then, for five bucks, you could fill up your buddy's Chevy love truck with a tank of gas, and he would drive you anywhere. And so my buddy drives me to my aunt's. I have a dresser and a couple of pair of, uh, you know, board shorts, and I'm going to be cool. I have a skateboard, and long hair, and the long hair helps you look the rock and roll part. In case you didn't know, and uh, my plan would have been uh, to be the next singer for Led Zeppelin, but a couple of things got in the way of that. Is that they weren't hiring, and I wasn't really a very good singer, but. That doesn't really <coughs> come into play. I never got my chance to audition, but I would have gladly done that job. And it sounded like a good job, right? Tour the country and the world with a pocket full of hashish and meet all these hot girls and sing like Robert Plant. Okay, it didn't happen. In case you think you see my face on that album cover, it was someone else, sadly. But what happened is, and I'd like to just also, uh, I'm going to back up for a minute. My father, he saw the writing on the wall. God bless him. He would tell me every so often, son, I think you should uh, look into a career in the United States military. I always had the same answer. And I, I don't to paint this picture real quick. We've had a beer party. There were three of us, so we got a keg. <laughs> that makes sense, right? We took my old bass drum that I wasn't using anymore, turned it upside down, filled it with ice, and put the keg in there. And it's in the back of my friend's truck because you never know where the party's going to go. That's how you did it in 1979. And so... I remember my friend Chris's truck is parked in front of my, my parents' house, and we're all hanging around the truck, you know, because we, 
woke up in the morning, hey, still stuff in the keg, come on over, let's go to Glenn's house. Well, Glenn's parents' house, because he's the tough guy that lives in his parents' house. So we're all standing out in front, and my dad comes out, he's mad as hell. I'm telling you, son, you're going to have to join the, the military. And my buddies start laughing at me. because My dad's embarrassing me now. And I tell him, Dad, I'm not going to be a jarhead. And they're going, yeah, we're not going to be jarheads. And off we go. And my aunt, I get to my aunt's house. And uh, she sits me down at the, at the kitchen table. Probably the first day there. And she breaks out this photo album. And it's this old black thing, you know. Opens it, it'll probably creaked, you know, for dramatic effect. We'll give that. It, I, that's how I remember you. It's, it's better every time I tell this story. And uh, yes, my home group has a motto. It's we never let the truth get in the way of a good story. If that's not already obvious, I told you that I'm a liar. I qualified twice. But the book creaked. We'll just say that. It was an old photo album. Thanks for going with me on that journey. And there's old dingy pages and dingy pictures, and there's this yellowish page, and there's some guy, and he's like standing to the left, and his hand is with some weird pocket or something, and he's got some corn cob pipe and a uniform. So this is your great great uncle, you know, Norbert Bigler, and he served with pride and dignity and honor in the United States, whatever. Marine Corps. Page after page, you know, Uncle So and so, Grandpa So and so, this and she shows me all these pictures and my family has a history of serving. Do you don't know, figure this out? My family has a long history of serving with pride and honor and dignity in the United States military, all the branches, until I, until I came along. And I don't know how, but she looked at me and said, I really think you should consider a career in the United States Navy. And I don't know why. I don't know what happened, but I said, okay. And she did her thing on me, the voodoo magic or something. And... I don't know if they had the room bugged or not, but it seems to me like the timing of everything that the Navy recruiter parachuted into the front lawn. And I swear to God, and he, I, I don't know how. This happened, but like, boom, and I'm taking this little test. And Well, Mr. Bigler, you know, based on your scores, you qualify for a program of this. And I'm just, well, can you teach me electronics? You bet. I think he would have said yes to anything I said. And then, you know, you're in the Navy now. you got to get out. So, you know, and wow. And I'm like doing my best to stand up straight. I'm tall and dorky and two left feet. And, you know, it's just, oh, it's awful. But the thing is, I remember graduating boot camp. Of my 19th birthday in San Diego, California, graduating boot camp. And I honestly don't know. It, it's just that God blessed me with just enough smarts to pass tests. I'm a really good test taker, it turns out. And um, I pass boot camp. And I'm graduating, and I'm marching by, and there's my mom and dad and my mom. I see her in the front row, and I see her crying because her son is going to join the military and be a man. And um, that, that didn't happen. But <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, Mom. She was so excited because they were going to ship me off overseas and see the world and make a man out of me. And um, it just didn't go that way because I took me with me. And she was so brokenhearted. I'll give you the geography. Um, Downey, California is here approximately 12 miles to the southwest of Downey, California, is Long Beach, California. And um, by that time, you know, I'd been through the electronics training and been got assigned to my permanent duty station of Long Beach, California. So I did not go see the world, and I did not go on the boats, on the ships, and do all that. No, I was in Long Beach, California, a shore station. <laughs> my mother's heart, she told me much, many years later how her heart just broke when she realized I was going to live at home and be in the Navy. <laughs> ah, but the joke's on you, Mom, because I'm a silver-tongued devil over here, and I got me a hostage. She's cute, and I'm living with her and her mom in an apartment. <laughs> that's how I roll. And uh, she, uh, wow, I get out of the Navy, because um, they're, they're pretty much done with me, but I'll tell you something beautiful. I had my very first, that I can recall, my first spiritual experience happened to me while I was in the Navy station in Long Beach. I was about 21 or 22 years old, and... I'm suffering pretty badly from alcoholism. You know, I, I got to drink every day and I got to carry on and do bad things and make bad decisions every day. And I ride this broken down motorcycle back and forth. And Man, I, I don't even know how I'm holding it together to even get myself into a uniform and stand there for morning muster. But one day at lunch, I'm going to go to the uh, enlisted man's club. They're open at lunch because they sell delicious, nutritious nachos because we know that only the losers would go to the chow hall for lunch. So I'm going to go get myself some nachos. For lunch because I'm probably nursing a little bit of a hangover and I've, I've got to get something going and nachos seem like a reasonable choice. So I'm walking through the enlisted man's club and here's a couple of old salts, Ed Brown and Les Gardner. You know darn well that you are uh, 
if you're able to look back that many years ago and recall <laughs> these guys' names and still picture their face, you know, it's got to have something to do with, with a good time. So Ed Brown and Les Gardner and these old salts are sitting at a table in the bar, and I'm walking through the bar to the nacho area and get my nachos. Hey, Big Larry, son, how you doing? And I mean, they're old salts. They're at least probably in their late 30s. I mean, they're, they're probably pretty getting on, right? Get my nachos, and I'm walking back through, and oh, Big Larry, what's on here? Man? Come sit down right here. And I'm like, mm, oh, okay. And I sit down at their table, and here's Ed and Les, and in front of them, each one of them is a pitcher of beer. And they call the bar girl over, and they're like, hum, 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 bring him a glass, and she puts a glass down, and hey, slow learner, fast forgetter, but y'all see it coming, right? Ding, they're about to pour me a beer. And um, every time when I tell this story, every time I start to honestly, the alcoholic in me, I just love it. If you have any sense of compassion or, or you can enjoy a good time, then you know you're probably going to feel good right about now, right? Because, oh, I swear to God, they're going to pour a beer, and they pour this beer in this glass, and I'm like, wow. And it goes to my lips, and I'm feeling better already. And I drink that beer down, and I say thank you, and the light goes on. Son of a bitch, you can drink at lunch. And I mean, I'm serious, slow learner. I didn't know until that moment you could drink at lunch, and they set me free just a little bit. What a great time, man. And I tell you, this is the part of my talk when I'm just starting to relax, because that just telling you that story makes me feel good. I just get the little... Just a little breath, just remembering that sick, sick young man who's getting his medicine. And um, you can drink at lunch. I'm going to tell you that it was just a hop, skip, and a drunk from there before uh, the next thing. By the way, if you're planning a relapse, I would like you to think about very carefully what I'm about to tell you, unless you already know this and you really should maybe not make the relapse. But if you don't already know this, I'll give you some advice. Not only can you drink at lunch, you can drink in the morning. Hop, skip, and a drunk from there, and I'm waking up drinking, drinking. Like, really. Got to find one of those beers that's still got something in it, or maybe there's a bottle of something around. And I, I, I just have to. I just have to drink in the morning. And the United States Navy, it's 1985, the United States Navy pretty much had their, had their fill of me and my shenanigans. And luckily, I just luckily, just narrowly escaped getting in all kinds of trouble. I got a little bit of trouble, but not too bad. And by 85, they had uh, discharged me honorably. Now I'm out. Thank God, because they were clearly the problem. And now I'm going to be somebody. So I get a job. So there's a guy who recognizes my superior electronics training and skill, which, whew, uh, man, I can change a fuse in your car, and that's just stop right about there. If I start to rewire your house, you, just tell me thanks and call an electrician. That's going to be your best bet. So I get out of the Navy, and they hire me as a field service technician for an x-ray company. Man, I'm going to be I give me a car, give me some tools, and my own business cards with my name right there. Yep, I'm pretty cool. I'm somebody. And this is the part where you all owe me a thanks because I believe that it was at that job that I invented the three-day weekend. This is how it went. <laughs> Every week on Thursday, they would hand me this thing called a paycheck. And I would take that paycheck because I'm a high roller uh, straight to the liquor store and cash my paycheck, which is what high rollers do. Um, they they might have had direct deposit back then, but bank account, schmack account. I'm just saying. <laughs> so if you pay me on Thursday, unfortunately, you are not going to see me on Friday. In fact, many times... And some of you can relate to this many times uh, on Sunday, it's getting late and you're looking at the clock, right? You know that guy? I'm that guy. It's like 11 and you know you should leave your buddy's house pretty soon so you can go get some sleep. But then it's midnight and then, you, you know, when you realize that you go, okay, I work in Glendale, I live in Downey, it's about an hour drive for going traffic. So I can get up at 6 and leave by 6.15. If I get the shower and if I just wash my face, I'm going to sleep till 5.30, okay? And you're doing the math and then it's 2.30 in the morning and you realize that you're screwed. Now, if you go to sleep, you'll never wake up. You know how many times I called my boss on Monday morning? I'm oh, really sick. <clears throat> sick. And uh, that's just me, sick. I can't make it to work. So there's the three-day weekend. And um, one more job and one more hostage had enough of me. And uh, luckily, and, and I firmly believe this, especially if you're new or near new, I want you to know that there are unseen forces working in your favor. I want you to know that. I want you to know that somewhere, if you're new or near new, and I'm sure the people who aren't new or near new know this already, but somebody had a busy day today. Some sober person in this room had a busy day today, yet they got all the way over here to this church tonight. And they might have done it begrudgingly, or they might have done it with duty and, and happiness, you know. But somebody came here and unlocked this room, went to the back of this room and made coffee so that you could come in here, and sit down, and have a cup of coffee. If that's not an unseen force working in your favor, I don't know what is. You know, and so on and so on, all over. 
Somebody brought these chips and put them here. Somebody's going to collect the money. We should watch that person closely. Hopefully it's not Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> but there are several people all over this city and all over cities just like this, all across this country and all around this world. And thank you, Mr. Noonan, for all your hard work. All around the world, they're translating the big book into different languages and having AA meetings where there were none before and saving the lives of alcoholics. There are unseen forces working in your favor, and luckily they were working in my favor too. <coughs> luckily. God's just watching me, waiting. When are you going to surrender, son? When are you going to surrender? Well, almost surrendered in late August of 1986. I um, I get kicked out of her house. She's done with me. The job is done with me. They want their car back because they'd really like an employee that shows up to work and actually does work. Go figure. And uh, it's like the tough guy, I call my mom and dad. So, yeah, we'll, we'll let you come back one more time. And I get back to their house. They sit me down that next morning. They sit me down at their coffee at their dining room table. And they said, we think you have a problem with drugs and alcohol. Well, I can remember going into that zone where you know you're present, but you're just not doing your, not, you're not doing the thinking or the operating. And I remember that I started to cry sitting at their table. And I got up from their table. And I remember walking out of their house, out the front door. I remember saying these words. I remember saying, God help me. And in tears... I walked down two doors down to the end house where my friend Ann lived. And I don't know how I put it together or how I knew this, but I plopped myself down on her table and I told her my life has to change. And Ann said, okay, tomorrow night I'm going to take you to a meeting. And I don't know what force, seen or unseen, gave me the intuition to go down to her house. But Ann was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she knew what to do with a sick young man. She knew to drag him to an AA meeting, to turn him over to the men in that AA meeting and say, take this broken kid, he's trying to get here. So about August 29th, 1986, and I'm bouncing off the walls and bouncing off the ceiling and I'm everywhere. And they grab me and they harness me down long enough to get me a sponsor. I, this guy, he'll make a good sponsor. Will you sponsor me? He says, sure. I didn't know that. He turned around. He told me this on my first birthday. He turned around to the lady and he, right in her face, Man, I was, a real, I was a real pretty boy. Let me tell you, I was. Uh, the book says an alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature. I might be the poster child for that one too. Pretty bad, pretty bad shape, very, very badly broken. And I get home. That was a Friday night. Saturday morning, I'm out in front of my parents' house doing something. I think my buddy was delivering my velour recliner chair from my ex-hostage's house. He was dropping it off and I loaded it into the room. So I wish I had that thing today. Epic chair. So I get the chair in my room because I'm cool and I have a chair. And that's about all I owned. <laughs> I think it might have been a hand-me-down. Um, out in front, a car pulls up and a guy is, it's a car, I don't actually recognize it. Guy lowers his window and he's looking at me and he's running in the street. You know, nowadays we'd call it a drive-by and we all hit the deck. But back then it was wasn't really drive-by time yet. And so he's looking at me and I'm looking at him and I'm a little scared. I don't know who this guy is. I'm walking closer, a little closer, and he finally lowers his down. And says, oh, if you know what varnays are, then you're, you know, not a spring chicken. And he lowers his varnays and he goes, "It's me, Alan." I'm like, "Oh my God, it's the town drunk." Who, by the way is one of my dear friends that I drink with him and do other bad things with him all the time. And like the town drunk is in front of my house and I'm like six minutes sober. I don't know what to do. So I walk up to his car and I, there was a paper bag on the, he hates the way I tell this story. His version is a little different than mine. There's a paper bag on his front seat and I'm terrified because I'm, you know, six minutes sober now. I take a deep breath. And I say, Alan, I don't drink and I don't do drugs anymore. And I, the first time in my life I'd ever said that out loud. And Alan looks at me and says, oh, yeah, neither do I. What? He goes, yeah. He reaches up. Alan, you don't drink. No, you don't do drugs. No. He reaches up and jingles his rearview mirror. We have these little keychain <laughs> chips that we give out. And he's got a newcomer chip, a 30-day chip, and a 60-day chip hanging from his rearview mirror. I'm like, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me. He goes, no. And I go, and now I know Alan. I've been drinking with this guy for years. And what's in that bag? Because I know it's either a 12-pack of Bud or two six-pack of Corona. I know this guy. 
And that's what's in that bag. What's in that bag? I really don't believe it. It's milk for my parents. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. His parents live, you know, down the road. Turned out he was in the local recovery place called Cider House, and he was out on a weekend pass. And he's idling his car in front of my house with his foot on the brake because they told him when they let him out on his first weekend pass, don't go by your old friend's houses. And he saw his dorky Glenn standing up front, and he said he was terrified, but he just thought, oh, I'll just see what that big dumb guy is up to. There are unseen forces working in his favor as well. He said, you know, he tells the story, he describes, you know, knowing he shouldn't have been in front of my house, shouldn't have been there, so he kept his foot on the brake, the whole never shut his car off. And he was terrified as well. And uh, I tell you right now, if it wasn't for Alan in those early days, I would have never made it. So I tell him, oh, well, I met this great group of people. Let's go to a meeting together tonight. He's like, all right. Off he goes. He got his number. And you know, that when you get an alcoholic like me, separate me from alcohol and other bad decisions, I get pretty uncomfortable pretty quick, especially when I have no no steps and no spiritual experiences and no way of living and no way of combating those demons that are going on inside this very sick young man. So I tell Alan later on that evening, I tell him, you know what, I'm, I don't feel that well. I don't think I'm going to go. And I go and I do, uh, this one's for you. I go and I do what I have to do and I, I just get all messed up. I don't know how my parents always left me unattended at just the perfectly right time. Like they, oh, another story for another time. Remind me someday, I'll tell you about their cruise to Alaska. That they went on a, like a 12-day Alaskan cruise while I was sober, newly sober. This was a good time. Um, we'll get back to that, I swear. <clears throat> so I carried on all night long, and I did a lot of things, and I had never really done all this other special chemicals that we see going on like crazy today. But this night, I, that's when I got a hold of this stuff. <laughs> Like, you know, for all you guys, you know, look through the blinds. That was never me, except this night, that was me. So I'm all spun out, and I'm paranoid and freaking out. And so I hear noise coming from under the house. It was a raised foundation, and there's something. There's both people living under the house. I swear to God, it made sense to me then. And so I checked the whole house. I'm looking in the closets, and I'm freaking out. This has never happened to me before. But this particular night, oh, yeah. So I'm checking everywhere because I'm convinced there are people either under the house or in the house. I checked the whole house, and then I opened the side door, and we got the attached garage, and there's like a long area next to the garage, and you just way down there, you know, lean over, it's way down there. And so I go out, the whole house has been searched, it's exhausting, and you go out, that's, I tell you what's easier, much easier to be sober than it is to carry on like that. This is the easier, softer way, you know what I mean. And I get out, and I look down there, and I flip the light switch on, it lights all the lights down the row, oh, nobody's there, I turn the lights off, and I go, I go back in the house, because it's at least 15 feet across the driveway, but I left the door open. And they're like, in that time that I walked out the door and looked at they could have gone in the house. So I go back in the door, and I closed the door, and I locked the deadbolt, and I searched the whole house again. And I never found them. <laughs> they sneaky, those figments of your imagination are very sneaky, and um, they know just when to hide. And so... I don't know how. I pass out. I come to the next day, and and my heart is broken. My heart is broken because here I am. I've come all this way, just a trashed human being. And um, I'm going to tell you about my New Year's. I don't have resolutions, but I have mottos, and they're going to come into play right now. And I'm, I'm this guy. I've been trying to stop living this way for so long, and I broke my own heart. Um, my New Year's resolutions, you're going to see them. They're going to come up real soon. Oh, you're going to make all these resolutions. Not you, because you're fine, upstanding people. You don't need resolutions. But the real losers are going to make this New Year's resolution. Sorry if you did this. You're going to go to the gym. And by February, <laughs> you're going to regret the fact that they're taking that money out of your account every freaking month. And you're not going to the gym. And you don't even want to go back and tell them, yeah, I'm sorry, I regret the fact that I signed up with your gym and I want to take my money back. And they were like, it was a $400 cancellation fee. You got me again. I don't believe in those loser resolutions. So I do the cool thing. Awesome, tough guys like me. I got New Year's mottos and slogans. And a broken young man would have a slogan and a motto like this. And this is how it started. When I was 19 years old, and I'm going to turn 20. I don't have any idea how it is I could remember such a ridiculous thing. But it must have been important to me at some time. I'm going to be 20, 19 years old. It's New Year's Eve. It's going to be 1981. And my slogan is, all done in 81. 
And they just get better from there. I don't know why I remember them. They were epic. What you're going to do in 1982, <laughs> drug free in 83, tell you this, you just paint the picture. What a successful, how successful I am when I drink and carry on. No more in 84. Stay alive in 85. Not making them up yet. Although it's time. I'm gonna, I will give you a little honesty tip. This one, this one, I don't remember what it could have been in 1986. I don't. So I'm going to use this one because I think that all the ladies in the room will agree this would have been a good choice for me. Meet some chicks in 86. What do you think? <laughs> it's all right. Thank you. The girl that laughed, you don't have to say it out loud. I get that you like me. <laughs> no, you heard her laugh, right? That's the... Okay, sorry. My bad. Um, I don't know. That's, that's the way I drink and that's the way I carry on. It's, I got these slogans and mottos and that's what my life had become. And, Stay Alive in 85, I mean, I, I remember thinking it, and I remember, I meant it, like, it's getting pretty bad. And so I wake up on September 1st of 1986, and my heart is broken, and I can't stand the guy that I've become, I can't live and I can't die, I can't imagine a life with it or without it. The jumping off point. And you know, if I would have, just one more chromosome left or right, I don't know, one more hangover, one more fixed pill, drug, drink, or whatever, and maybe I'd have been that guy, because I sure wanted to die, but I just couldn't pull it off. I just couldn't pull it off. It seemed very violent, very horrible, and I must, don't really like violence and horrible things. So uh, I decide I'm going to go straight back to AA, and I and I go back and I and I run back and I hope hope to God that's my permanent sobriety. I plan to do everything uh, everything I can to keep that sobriety date of September 1st, 1986. And I uh, I tell you, I, I came into the program and I fudged my dates around like you know still standing up as a newcomer, and oh my God, you're going to find out that I'm really got three days less than I'm supposed to have. It's a lot of work. I'm just going to say, if you have a sobriety date right now, keep that one. It's so much work when you're like, okay, if I take a 30-day chip at 33 days, and then carry the one, okay, then I take a 60-day chip at 62 <laughs> days. By the time I get a 90-day chip, I'll have 90 days. And, okay, whew. So when I took that 90-day chip, and I had the 90 days, and I, told, I finally fessed up, and I told everybody, and then I'm going to give a crap. They're like, oh, okay, cool. I'm like, what? You know how much math I've been doing and running around and freaking out I've been all this time? And, uh, no, they didn't care. They're, okay, good for you, man. We're glad you're here again. Keep coming back. <laughs> oh, boy. And um, you know, they just keep pointing me towards the steps. And I, I've made every mistake you can make in Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of them I've made multiple times. And the one mistake I refuse to make is to drink. I refuse to drink. I refuse to use chemicals and do those things that get me in trouble and get me into jam every time you showed me how. You showed me how through the miracle of a process of the 12 steps, you know, through a miracle of the fact that there are unseen forces working in my favor, a secretary, and a treasurer, and a coffee maker. They all have days. Whoever came here and made coffee, thank you. Who made coffee tonight? Just show me. Raise your hand. Eric. Thank you. Thanks for getting here and making coffee. That's awesome. Right. Thank you, Aaron. Right. So don't think, did you work today? So I had the day off. Well, what the heck? <laughs> this is the part where you lied to me. No, but I mean, honestly, thanks. Derek. You could have done any, any number of things. You he chose works to come every to. other time. See? That's what I'm saying. You could have done any number of things. You chose to show up here and make us coffee. So that's just what I'm saying. It's like those are the simple things that a lot of people, I think, take for granted. I would like to tell you guys a couple of, a couple of little closing stories and one little thing that tweaked my sobriety that I didn't see coming. We study the book where I'm from. We studied a lot, and there are a lot of book studies out here. And uh, not really a book thumper. I may quote a page and, you know, tell you what something's on, but typically I'll just, you know, just wing it. But one thing I know I'm not going to get wrong is at the top of page 77, it says, our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. And I would just guess, I would just guess that half the people in the room heard me say what our real purpose is, to be of maximum service. Right? Anybody hear that? So I'm going to say, I had a boy. Because um, when I finally looked at that, I realized that to me, in my opinion, for you, it's all up to you. In my opinion, I discovered a few years back that the most important words in that sentence are fit ourselves. And I realized that my, there's a huge difference for a guy like me between being of maximum service and fitting myself to be of maximum service. When I'm of maximum service, I'll take out the trash. Let me get that chair. I'll hold your door. Carry your groceries. Yeah, I'll give you $5. Not you. So don't, yeah, after the meeting, right? I'll be that guy. But if I fit myself to be a maximum service, I'm going to go through the steps. I'm going to show up, be a member of the fellowship, 
go to meetings, go to wherever else God sends me, and be ready. Be ready for the work. God will give me the work to do. He'll show me. When it's time, he'll send me in. This is a job for Glenn. In, in goes Glenn. Sometimes I, I see it coming, and sometimes I don't. I never know. Sometimes I'm an influence in the right way to the right guy at the right time. I don't even realize I left an impression until much later. Somebody says, you know, when I met you that time, you shook my hand, you smiled, you had that look in your eye like you were okay. You know what? I'm okay. I'm okay because of you guys at meetings like this, and I didn't see it coming. And once I realized that my real purpose is to fit myself, that just takes all the responsibility off of me to have to go do something right, except come here. Surrender to this program and surrender to this way of life. It's the only thing that ever worked, and it made such a huge difference for me. It made coming to meetings so much more important to me. It made a prayer life so much more important. Bless you. And I, I can tell you with all conviction in the world that I know today these three things are true. Prayer works, the 12 steps work, and God is real. And, you know, if you're an atheist or an agnostic, I, you, I hope you're okay with that. And if you're not, that's all right. It's my truth. Prayer works. The steps work. God is real. There are unseen forces working in your favor. Let me tell you how they worked in my favor. A couple of years ago, I have a take-home car from my job. I have a single-lane driveway in my house, and there's no overnight parking during the week on my street. I don't know if you can process all that. A lot of useless information, and it'll come together for this little story. So I get home from my, in my work car, I get home from work. I park my work car in the street so I can get to my personal car and drive it around to go, you know, do important things like get pizza and go to AA meetings. And there's a family that moved in across the street. Their house is like my driveway, and then their house is across the street right there. And it was, um, we just have modest homes in, in my neighborhood. They're about 15, 1,600 square foot. Most of them are three bedroom, two bath. And there was a lovely family that lived across there. There was a mom and a dad and their two boys. Lovely. They sell their house. They move up the hill. In comes the new neighbors. And it's a mom and a dad and 10 children. And I'm like, the whole neighborhood is up in arms. Like, oh, my God, have you seen the new neighbors? Oh, it's awful. And, you know, uh, right after they move in, the mom announces to the neighborhood, God has blessed me with another child. So now it's a mom and a dad and 11 children. Oh, it gets better. She has her 11th child. And then the oldest child's daughter, she's also under 18. She announces she's pregnant. God has blessed my 17-year-old unmarried daughter with a child. So I'm, not that I'm judging. Can you tell them before telling that story? I'm not judging. Whoa. And I don't like them. Because, you know, they're just a mess in the neighborhood, and they leave trash. Their little dog chases me up and down the street, like, on my lawn. I'm like, get off my lawn. And, it's, you know, here's the thing. I don't, I'm not cruel to animals anyways. I love animals, especially dogs, cats, whatever. You know, it's that size dog. If you went to kick it, you'd fall. The dog would move. You'd break your back, and you'd be that grumpy old jerk in the neighborhood who tried to kick the dog and broke his back trying to kick the dog. So it's not going to go good for me. So I don't kick the dog. I just look at it like, I'll bite you right now. Like, I don't like the dog. It's all my life. Okay. You get the idea. It's a nuisance. This family's a nuisance. Did I mention they're a nuisance? So, one day, thank you, Joshua. They're a nuisance. <laughs> so, this Monday night, I'm pulling my car in front of the house, and I see one of their kids. I don't know, but one of them. And he's sitting on the curb, and he's kind of got his head down, and his eyes are all red, and he's either crying or he's smoked too much of that stuff. And, uh, Whatever. It's not my problem. And uh, I pulled my car up in front. I turned the key off. And I hear, and I clearly hear, go to the boy. Now, this isn't anything I would ever say to myself. You know, I would say, self, you know, let's play that ACDC song really loud. Like, that's the kind of thing I'm going to hear. Like, you know, let's have some pizza. Or, you know, I'm going to mood for a nap. So, uh not go to the boy. Just want to say, for the point of the story, that this is unusual. And it's not that I'm imagining this because I turned the key off and I willfully disobey this voice because, no, you might have heard me describe them, and by the way, I'm not doing it. So I get out of the car, and what's funny about this is that I can pinpoint the moment that I acknowledge that I heard this. Because I get out of my car, and I walk down the street, up my driveway, and in my side door, which is where me and all my friends enter my house, in the side door. Instead, I go into the front of the car, straight across the lawn to check my mailbox, because, you know, crying junior over there might be seeing me. I don't know if he's looking at me or not. I'm looking at me, because I somehow I know I'm not going to the boy, and I don't want nothing, I don't even look. No eye contact. So I go straight across the lawn, like I check my mailbox, straight across the bricks, don't even go, 
Don't even want this guy to look. I'm looking down, and I go up my driveway, and I put my key in the side door, and I hear it a second time. Go to the boy. And I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. I turn the key. I go in. And it's Monday night, by the way. i got to go and change, and i got to... No, it's Tuesday night. That's right. I gotta go to one of my home groups. So it's Tuesday night. I got a book study to go to. I gotta drive about 15 miles in traffic. I have to go in the house, change, get myself fed, you know, be an adult. Turn, close the door, hit the deadbolt, and the third time, go to the boy. And I'm getting tired of this. And I'm like, really? And I'm having this conversation out loud. It's just me in the house, but I'm saying, really? Seriously? I put my crap down on the counter. I'm like, fine, I'll go to the boy. Like, how many times you got to tell me, I'll go to the boy. I mean, you can tell I'm excited about going to the boy, right? Not even a little bit. And um, so this is how sneaky this disobedient human being is. I, uh, this is probably 28 years sober. Go to the boy, right. Not going to do it. And I unlock my door, and I remember opening the door really slow, kind of looking out. <laughs> Maybe he'll be gone. God darn it, he's still sitting there. So I'm kind of shuffling my feet, walking down the driveway, and I'm thinking, I don't even know what, I, I don't know what, I'm gonna, what am I going to say to this kid? Like, he's some teenage kid, his eyes are all red, he's probably half-baked on weed, and I'm like, hey, kid, you look like, what's your problem? Hey, what's the matter for you? Like, what am I going to say? I don't know this kid. And I get halfway across the street, and he looks up, and I say, hey, are you doing okay? And he stands up, and he's like, no. I'm like, oh, man. So he comes, meets me in the middle of the street. And now I feel it. I feel like a grade-A a-hole, because I don't even know this boy's name. They lived across the street from me for at least a year, maybe two. Shame on you, Glenn, because you've been so busy judging this horrific circus that's going on over here. You haven't even noticed to ask them their names. I'm like, oh, crap. And he's crying. He says he's not okay. He said, well, tell me your name. He says, my name's Isaiah. I said, okay, Isaiah, you know, I'm Glenn. Let's go sit over here. And I pull him over, and we sit on the curb. I tell him, what's going on, bud? And he says, um, I feel like my whole family hates me. My mom is yelling at me. My family's yelling at me. And I'm dumb. My mom called me dumb. And I don't even know why God put me here. And man, once he said that, I was like, God dang it, why'd you have to go there? It's like, really? And I put my arm around him and I told him, listen, I can tell you right now you're not dumb. Because I asked you what was wrong. And you spoke. And you're very articulate. And you explained the problem to me. So clearly you're not dumb. But you, you can talk and you can... You're okay. I said, um, I don't know why your family's mad at you. He said, well, we can talk about that. I said, but I want you to know that it's okay to not know why God put you here. But you have a purpose. And I promise you, you do. And I promise you, God don't make junk. And this is all the stuff you taught. To know how to tell a troubled child that he's going to be okay. And that God don't make junk. Which you guys have had to tell me many times. Many times I felt like nothing. And you said, you have a purpose. Find it. We'll help you find it. Tell him, God don't make junk, man. you got a purpose, and you can spend your life looking for it. You'll find it. I said, now, why did why your, your mom call you dumb? Why are they mad at you? And he says, well, I'm, I, I'm having trouble in school. I keep failing my tests. And I'm thinking, yeah, because you're smoking weed all the time. And I'm like, well, how come you're failing the test? You know, do you go to school? I'm thinking, no, you did school. You, you know, you're going <laughs> smoking weed at break, and you don't go to school, and I know. Not that I'm judgmental, but that could be my history um, a little bit. Anyway, he says, yeah, I go to school every day. I said, well, why are you failing the test? He says, because I can't read. <laughs> really? And I'm thinking, really? God, honestly, why am I sitting here? And I tell him, listen, I've never helped anybody learn to read before. I don't even know if I can do it. But I'm willing to try to help you if you would like. I said, I'm busy tonight and I'm busy tomorrow night. Thursday night, if you're interested, I'll, I'll try to help you read. He says, okay, that would be great. Stand up, tell him you'll be all right. Go to school, it's okay. Just do the best you can, just go to school. And he goes to give me a hug. I'm like, all right, just give me a hug. And I go to like, kid, like you double clutch me, man. I'm like, whoa, okay, like you're hugging me. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, okay, good, out of way to go. And lots of, I let him go and I tell him, I'll check on you. So, go to my meeting, do my thing. Wednesday comes, pull up in front of my house. Oh, yeah, here's a little reminder. <laughs> I can forget anything. Why well, don't forget? I'm going to check on the kids. So, sure enough, I get my stuff. I'm walking up my driveway. I go, oh, yeah, you got to check on the boy. And I look across the street. 
garage is down, both teeny kids playing, which is unusual because they're out there every day, like the whole football team is in front of their house. And, um, you know, diapers, whatever, and then nothing. Okay, well, I checked on them. Okay, good. I go to my meeting, come home Wednesday night, nothing. Thursday, same thing. Now, this time I know. I've told him that I would be available Thursday, so I know how to make myself available. So I pull up in front, get out of my car, walk up the driveway. Oh, yeah. And I look. Oh, nothing. Did my job. Okay, go in the house, and I close the side door. I don't know. You remember when the Navy recruiter, like, parachuted in my front lawn? He ninjaed himself because I closed the side door and on my front door. I'm like, oh, what? I don't it happened so fast, I don't even know how he got all the way across from, there was no one. I walked to the front door, I opened the door, and, you know, hey, hi, good to see you. Is this a good time for you? Oh, no. I opened the front door, whoosh, in my house. Like, <laughs> all right, you're coming in, great. Close the door, here we are. How about, you notice I didn't say I changed, I relaxed, I fed myself, none of that. I'm going to, little whiny, because I'm not liking it. And uh, we sit down at the table, and we open the book, and he starts to read, you know, the car is blue. He sounds out the words, and I can tell what he's reading. He's having a hard time sounding out the words. I said, well, what did you just read? Well, I read, the car is blue. I said, no, no, no. What does it mean? Describe what you read. He's unable to describe to me what he read. I said, so I don't want to hurt your feelings or anything, but I need to tell you that this book is above your reading level, and we're going to need to go get a book that's a little better suited to your reading level. You can start reading you know, some basic books and build from there. He says, okay. So, well, there's a bookstore at the mall. Let's go check with your folks. And I go over and I say hi to the dad. How are you, sir? He says, grabs me and hugs me. He says, thank you for helping my son. I was like, uh, yeah, I haven't really done anything, but okay. I don't know what page of the book you're on, but we haven't done anything. So, okay, sir, well, I'm going to take him to the bookstore. Okay, he says, absolutely. So we drive to the bookstore, and I mentioned the part where I didn't eat. This much body needs a lot of health food, so Chinese food sounds good to me. And there's the little Panda Express, and I look at the teenage kid, and I'm like, I know the answer. You ask a teenage kid if they're hungry. I mean, the answer is usually. You hungry? Yeah. You like Chinese food? Yeah. Okay. So we go over there. It's like our first date. We're in line at the Chinese food. Oh, yeah, because here it comes. He's, we're in line at the Chinese food, and he pops the question. He says, so tell me about yourself, Glenn. I'm like, well, kid, let me tell you. I'm in AA. I got a really crap program because I don't want to know you and I don't want to meet you and I can't stand you and I heard, go to the boy, go to the boy, go to the boy. I'm hungry and I'm and here we are, you're ruining my life. Like, what am I going to say? Really, what am I going to tell this kid? Sober. This is a poster child for Alcoholics Anonymous. So I just tell him, well, I start off every day with prayer. And every day I offer my life to God and ask him to show me what he would have me do. If I didn't mention it, I'll tell you now that I'm a big believer in the third and seventh step prayer, and I say them every day, and sometimes I have to say them a lot. As you can tell, only took three times go to the boy. And I tell him that because I don't know what else to tell him. And he says, well, I, I figured that. I said, you did? He said, yeah, that's what I told the people at church. I said, really? What did you tell the people at church? That's what I told them all about you. I'm thinking, you don't know the first thing about me. I said, what, what, why did you tell the people at church about me? He said, because after my mom was yelling at me, my whole family was yelling at me. I didn't know what to do with myself, and I ran out of the house crying. I sat on the curb. I was praying. I asked God to send me someone. And I looked up, and there you were. I spend the rest of my life trying to repay Alcoholics Anonymous for making me the man I am today. He shined his light on me, and it's my job to shine it anywhere I go. I would be embarrassed for the fact that it took him three times to get me to go to the boy, but I don't care, because I win. Maybe I'll do better next time. There are unseen forces working in your favor, and work in my favor, and work in young Isaiah's favor. He graduated high school. He went to the continuation school, and they took good care of his special needs. He graduated. He gave the speech because the counselor called him in the office and said, you showed the most improvement in any student this year. We want you to give the speech. He came over to invite me to his graduation. He said he's given the speech. It's called My Star. He said I wanted you to know about it because it's about you. I helped him read a few times. Barely gave him half an effort, but I gave him what I had. 
I owe that to you. I owe that. I owe my life and the fact that God shined his light on my heart. I owe that to you. It's not why I came here. I came here because I got sick and tired of having alcohol kick my ass. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for loving me and just some semblance of health and keep pointing me towards the steps. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.